Thank you. And again, thank you all for coming. So this is about teachers' council meetings. It's about teacher collaboration. I visited uh, with a fair number of people outside of the LDS community about teacher collaboration as a topic. Um, given President Nelson's emphasis upon using the name, the Church of Jesus Christ, or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I don't know, is the LDS educators going to change their name? The Church of Jesus Christ Educators Conference? It's dilemmas that we all face. And words, I think, are powerful. They do influence us. And uh, There's something called Thorndike's Word Book. The 500 most used words in the English language have over 10,070 separate and distinct meanings. The words we use all the time can have powerful and separate meanings. Take a word like fast. Everybody knows what fast means, right? Fast horse is one that runs fast. That is, of course, unless it's tied fast. Fast colors don't run at all. Fast photographic film is light sensitive, while fast bacteria is light insensitive. We know that in a religious fast, we abstain from practically everything. Well, somebody said fast women abstain from practically nothing. And in that sense, if a girl said to a boy, you're going too far, if what she really means is you're coming too close. So the words themselves can sometimes influence us. I guess we're all kind of ex-Mormons now, are we? Uh, I don't know. We, we, uh, teaching in the Savior's way is, is meaningful and significant. Just briefly as a pre-assessment, why did you come? What, when you looked at the agenda, what caused you to say, I want to go to teacher councils? A little bit of a pre-assessment. Can two or three of you tell me why you're here? Other than maybe it was the easiest place to stay? Okay. <laughs> Figure it out. Why this session? Um, I think that our teacher council meetings need a lot of improvement. Good. Please. Yeah, please. I'm one of the guys that keeps complaining to my wife. <laughs> You're at the other end. You know that, please. Um, being involved in Alpine School District where we've done the professional collaboration for a number of years, I was interested in getting a spiritual gospel perspective on how we can better collaborate and how we can Maybe How to make in, it work. Bring, bring in, make it softer, if you will, rather than so secular. Sure. A little more, a little more fun to be involved in rather than just, okay, here's, here's the checklist that we go through. Good. Thank you all. I'm, I'm going to stop because I'm going to go on. But I, I think you represent at least what I've found. I've, I've talked to members of the General Sunday School Presidency from Dan Judd to the current um, Mark Pace recently called, and Russ Osgathorpe and Ted Collister in between. I think there is a sense that uh, this is a really good aspiration, what we're trying to achieve with teacher councils, but we're not there yet. And as many of you suggested, we're perhaps the gap is, is uh, larger than we think. Well, part of that goes to what are teacher councils really all about. Mm hmm This one, right? Yeah. Am I stuck? Technology, when it works, we're all happy. When it doesn't work, we're frustrated. Here we go. Got it. So first of all, it's important to get some terms. What are teacher councils intended to do, as described by various presidents, uh, uh, general Sunday school presidents, or the resource guide itself? And I've listed uh, here the purposes of teacher councils as our our leaders have described them. Discussion forums, not teacher training. It's not in service. It's not teacher training in a typical form. There's a resource guide to help in gospel learning and a specific gospel learning model, a three-step, if you will, gospel learning model on how teachers in the church are expected to teach. Uh, it's a place to share experiences, concerns, and, and possibly get new ideas as, a, as an approach. 
Importantly, a place to practice new teaching methods in a safe environment and then create opportunities for collaboration. Uh, it, it's intended to be not overly programmed, as Elder Holland emphasized, but also not something where you just show up and look for the spirit. So somewhat those are extremes. What's the difference between and how do you get operational the difference between not being overly programmed and at the same time um, not simply showing up and saying, hey, what's on everybody's mind? It really is a change management method or model. And so as a reference point, uh, in the 1940s, Fritz Rothersberger at the University of Michigan uh, created a, an approach about personal change management that's still used today, whether it's Weight Watchers or Alcoholics Anonymous, or to some extent, what's behind teacher council meetings. And he did it by using a, a meat rationing experience. So in the 1940s, I don't think any of us here are old enough to have experienced it, uh, the US went on a, a campaign to get people to eat non-rationed cuts of meat, things like heart and liver and kidney, things that most of us perhaps don't find all that appealing, so that the better cuts of meat could be used for the war effort sent overseas. And Roethlisberger started by having lots of experts come in, uh, talk about whether it's the war effort from a patriotic point of view, or how to prepare these non-ration cuts of meat, or uh, other lectures on the value of it. There were some misconceptions about whether heart and liver were good for you or not. And eventually uh, measured what percent of change as a result of having these experts in a variety of different cities, all <laughs> anticipating support for the war effort, how many people actually on a consistent basis over a six month period went out and bought and used non-ration cuts of meat. What would you guess? Not very many. Three percent. Three percent of people, mostly women, households, actually went out, bought, and used non-ration cuts of meat. Uh, pretty discouraging data. So he then went back to try to better understand what other kinds of approaches might make a difference, and eventually settled on something where there were three distinct elements. Still had some lectures, if you will, some information given. But then people put people into small groups, and so small groups have become the norm for everything, no pun intended with my name, uh, put people into small groups, let them talk. What was a critical element was not just putting in people into small groups and letting them talk, but having a personal decision. In that small group, if people didn't make a personal decision on what they were going to do differently, nothing changed. If they did, it increased the likelihood a great deal. The third element was make a public commitment in that small group to say, here's what I'm going to do. As a result of his research and effort, again, measured how many people went out and bought and used non-ration cuts of meat. It was about 37 percent, just over a third, far less than half, but it became the basis for looking at personal and behavioral change really since the 1940s. Teachers, councils come from some of that same approach, some of that same, if you will, uh, method using, there we go. So here's what I've done. Um, I've interviewed, as I mentioned, uh, altogether seven different uh, members of general Sunday school presidencies, uh, 13 Ward and stake Sunday school presidents. I'm a stake, I'm a ward Sunday school president, have been for the last two years, so I have my personal experience. 11 different interviews with professional educators and 43 interviews with teachers in various locations. Um, a, a set of uh, specific questions as a basis for trying to understand what's different and what's the same. And specifically, as we've changed from uh, meeting once a month to meeting once a quarter. So in your own ward, if you've been participating in ward 
teacher council meetings. What's your own experience as the change has occurred from monthly to quarterly? Anybody can say, here's what's different compared to when we were meeting to when we're meeting now on a quarterly basis? Are you participating actively enough? You can comment. The monthly seem to have a greater effect on the quality of teaching in our ward. Once we went to the quarter, it just kind of really almost visually went back to the old lecturing, presenting information, instead of the participatory learning. And, uh, that's my, I was a Sunday school president also. And, that's my observation. Good. It may be just unique to our work. Good. And it, it's not. Anybody else? Please. I, I definitely agree. I, we've seen a slump, but we've also seen less participation. People, it's not in their wheelhouse enough that it, it's harder to get people physically there in the first place. Good. Yeah, just the, the logistics challenge of it, uh, since there's now only uh, two hour meetings. What's interesting, as many people have commented, is there's almost a sense of resentment sometimes. Hey, we got two hour meetings, everything was supposed to cut back. What's happening here that this isn't being reduced in the same way? And this sense of, well, we gotta get through something as opposed to let's listen to each other. I ask people uh, to tell me as well, <laughs> thank you, what are the topics that are discussed in your teacher council meetings? Over the last two years, what are the things that uh, most often are discussed? 37% said teaching by the spirit and teaching the doctrine. Perhaps not surprising. Um, third, 31%, almost a third, is whatever the first person brings up. Which, if you've been a part of any kind of group experience, usually the first person sets the tone for whatever that topic is, sometimes good, sometimes bad, to the extent that the teacher council meetings are so informal and flexible, sometimes a very few people and their concerns dominate. Reaching out to others and the use of visual aids and other resources were mentioned fourth and fifth, much lower percentage, 16% and 14% collectively as topics discussed. How does that compare to your own experience in teacher council meetings? What, what are the topics that you discuss most often? Are they fall into these categories or are they something else? Please. Good. More distractions, if you will. Anybody else? Topics? How to teach the new curriculum. You know, the, the new curriculum that's coming out is how do you actually teach the new curriculum with the format that's different. And so it's kind of like the, the change of that and the discussion of how this is better create a classroom according to the new curriculum that is coming out. Good. What does this home centered mean, church supported? Which which we'll, all would, teachers would recognize sounds good. Again, how do you implement that? How do you take that? Is this going to work or do I need to? <laughs> Sorry. If you turn it around, you might be able to. OK. Thanks. So again, I ask this sample size, uh, including the general Sunday school presidencies, uh, about obstacles. What are the things that are the most difficult? Uh, this whole sense of the changing teacher's role. What is it that we really want teachers to, to be? In our stake, uh, teacher councils, come follow me, were all announced uh, May 1st of 2016, church-wide. So it's been almost three years. Good time for reflection. In our stake, there was a heavy emphasis on be a facilitator, don't, don't have a prepared, if you will, um, lesson plan, a written lesson plan. And more recently, the church has come out and in essence said, bad idea. We didn't mean it. If that's what you understood, we're sorry. We want you to be teachers. We want you to teach the doctrines specifically. And so as I've interviewed people, it's, it's this vacillation. OK, I know I'm not supposed to. I wasn't supposed to be a lecturer to begin with. Now I'm not supposed to be a facilitator. What, 
what exactly is this role that I'm expected to play and how do I do it? Um, many people said about teacher council meetings that big stumbling block is the reluctance of members to be vulnerable in councils. It goes to this deep learning topic that Elder Clark introduced. The reluctance of saying, uh, I've, I've got a problem, can you help me? Uh, the difficulty of, in any environment, not wanting to be judged, starting out saying, uh, I'd like to improve, more than just a, a sort of classroom management piece, which is important, especially for youth and, and primary, perhaps even for adults, but how to make the things that we teach really stick. Um, Leader discomfort with some lack of control in the council meetings was emphasized a fair amount. And then uh, Brother Collister in particular, after reporting that he and his presidency have gone to uh, more than 200 different teacher council meetings over the last three years, that in almost never is there any practice that's occurring in a teacher council meeting. He hasn't been, nor they, to almost never where there is some kind of, whether role play is an example or a case study, not just the description of a problem or an incident, but some kind of practice that might occur. Has that occurred in any of yours? Has his experience uh, seem to resonate with your own? Please. Good, thank you. Anybody else? Any experience, one way or another? So primary can have separate sessions, as you probably know. Uh, any demographic group can split out from a teacher council meeting, or they can be combined together. And I think um, it's this sense of, do we really have this flexibility to do different kinds of things that uh, as teacher council meetings have evolved, that there's some, some struggle with. So let me ask a question as well from a transition point of view. In the teaching in the Savior's way, there's a self-assessment question, questionnaire. Um, it's not labeled as a questionnaire, but there's 25 or so questions where you can evaluate yourself on kind of a yes-no scale. Anybody ever done that? One. How many people didn't know it was there? Yeah. So that's kind of my experience as I interviewed people. Very few people knew about this self-assessment. Where am I not pointing? There we go. Suggestions for improvement. Um, as in visiting with this wide variety of people with different teaching experiences, uh, many suggested, you know, if I had some kind of way of just assessing myself, that might be helpful, not realizing that it was available in the teacher's guide. As a brief reference, 2 Corinthians 13 and 5, somebody mind turning to that and reading it? 2 Corinthians what? 13, 5. It's the first part of the verse that's the most significant. Go ahead. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves, know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be retrobates. retrobates. The next verse says, and of course you're not retrobates, sort of a funny uh, phrase following. But examine yourselves. Not easily done in many instances. Uh, so I've been involved in leadership and management training in a corporate setting for a long period of time, this sense of being able to look at myself, look at my leadership practices, 
difficult for people to do, and sometimes to the point where we walk away feeling, boy, maybe I'm not as good as I thought I was. Well, many times, self-assessment, rather than looking at how well we're doing and being able to problem solve, we instead turn it into some form of self-loathing. I'm really not that good. Maybe I shouldn't be a teacher. What's your own experience in personal evaluation? Are there ways that when you've done, whether it's teaching experience or something else, that's been helpful for you in keeping self-examination in perspective, looking at things where maybe there's an opportunity for improvement and then doing some goal setting? What's helped you, please? Twenty-five questions is, are too many. Okay. In other words, if you're going to assess what you're doing, you need to pick out two, maybe two things in that list, or have it assigned in, in the teacher, the teacher council, or something. Okay. Let's let's focus on these two things. Ask yourself, how uh, how are you doing on these two things? Good. The other thing is that usually you can gauge how well you're doing by the results. Are they making any difference? Everybody doesn't teach the same way. And you may not be doing some of these things and still be a successful teacher. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, I was going to mention that a lot of times it's really important to kind of look back where you've come from as well. Like if you're climbing the mountain uh, and you get halfway up, it might feel like you still have a long way to go. You have these goals you're trying to get your students to uh, get to or that you want to have your family work towards. It's just take the time to stop and see how far you've come. Look down at the parking lot where your car is and say, oh, you've come quite a big, big bit of distance. Gives you that incentive to keep moving forward. Excellent. So there's uh, a new approach these days called appreciative inquiry, where you look at your strengths and you say, how can I build on things that I'm already doing well? Not just close gaps where I'm doing something poorly, but what am I doing well, derives from competitive advantage in business. What are the things I'm already doing well? How can I make that a focus? How can I build on the things that I'm doing well in addition to focusing on things that perhaps need some additional help? Another suggestion for improvement, uh, create enough meeting structure for continuity planning and learning outcomes, especially with um, teacher council meetings having now a three-month gap between them. What's available to do in between those three? And certainly technology makes it easier today to do some things, assuming we get comfortable with it. Uh, being able to model gospel learning in a council meeting. So I mentioned, but didn't describe very much, uh, the church's model, if you will, for teaching. It's fairly distinct. It might not be that radical for most of you. Maybe it's things you're already doing. But it's sort of three steps. Share and counsel, discover and learn, invite and act. So the idea is, again, from a continuity point of view, at the end of a class or a lesson, there's an invitation to act. In Preach My Gospel as a mission president, I often emphasized, if you don't invite the investigator, the contact to do something, all you've done is just talk, talk, talk. If, unless there's an invitation to act somewhere, you haven't really taught. Well then, the follow-up is, well, what did you do? So at the beginning of each lesson, if you will, whether it's you who taught or a team teacher, the anticipation is there'll be a short discussion of did you apply what the last week's, last month's, last quarter's invitation to act was. There's some kind of follow-up, some kind of accountability, some short discussion of share and counsel together, then discover and learn, then invite and act. And so Brother uh, Collister and Devin Durant uh, emphasized, we think we've helped move the needle on discover and learn, but we haven't moved it at all on 
share and counsel and only a little bit on invite to act. So we'll see how good we are. What's your sense of Elder Clark? I mean, it's the first time for us in each of these three, share and counsel, this sense of something that happened previously, did he start with that to bring it in to all of us as a group? What's your sense? And he asked us to read it ahead of time. Yeah, so it wasn't that class didn't begin when he started talking. The class began two days ago when he sent us something not just to read, but to ponder. He invited us to come prepared to share what we had read. Discover and learn, I think we'd all say, yeah, that was there. I mean, lots of discussion and, and experiences. What about uh, uh, invite to act? What's your sense? Anyone? Anyone? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, because the spirit was here, which invites us to act. A little subtle, I'm going to say. There, there wasn't a, and here's what I'd like you to do. I mean, he summarized his three points well. An invitation to act might have been, I'm not criticizing him, might have been something like, here's what I'd like you to now go do in this next week or this next month or tomorrow. An invitation to act. That's what, again, hate to sound like a mission president, but we would say, we'd like you to read these scriptures or we'd like you to pray or attend church or to fast. There would be a concrete action step an invitation to act. And so the same invitation to act is embedded in the gospel, and I'm not criticizing him, I'd like to just emphasize it's that invitation to act that's part of the church's model of teaching. And without that invitation, we're perhaps less effective. Sure. Um, but I did, I did feel that a lot of people were actually thinking about different circumstances in their lives, and maybe, hopefully, we will act on that. But sure. And had he had more time, as I like always, if I had more time, uh, there would be, why am I pushing this the wrong way? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, uh, it's not that it has to be a pan in the face each time. It's a conscious effort to say, Here's a model of teaching. Now, how do I, in a teacher's council meeting, emphasize that as much as possible? I've given two examples, if you will, case studies as possible applications for a teacher council meeting. I want to just reference those. Amy, I'm going to have to go past both of them. Uh, one in teaching, one in leading a teacher council meeting, and end my last slide with a summary of things to consider as each of you involved in teacher council meetings, interested in teacher council meetings, um, might, uh, uh, along with the earlier suggestion, suggestions for improvement, uh, th think about. So in our ward, we're, we're looking at this transition and how do we do things kind of outside the council meeting itself. We're, we're starting to create a message board, but not everybody is interested. I mean, some people want to just come, give their lesson, and go home. They're, we ought to recognize that aspirationally, not all teachers think about teaching, want to be as effective in their class, whether it's primary or Sunday school or, or young men, young women. So what is it that a teacher council meeting needs to do outside, especially when it's difficult to get everybody to come, outside of that 30 minutes? What are the technology possibilities? And then uh, as we better understand what's happening at the home, how can that be supported at church? So 
In education today, there's a term called flipped classrooms, and those who are professional educators know about it. I'm going to give you just a brief summary and then end uh, and turn the mic over to Amy. Flipped classrooms uh, are, in the old days, the teacher would give a lesson in school, in a, in a public school, and then students would work the problem at home, would do homework. Flipped classrooms change that. Students learn the base material, the information, at home, and then they come to school with a mentor, an expert, to do their homework. I think the church is trying to have us do the same thing. At home, we read the lessons. All of us go through the uh, Come Follow Me material at home. We get the information. And then at church, we do homework. We're doing the problem solving. We're doing the application. And that's a transition for us, but perhaps there's something to learn about that transition from flipped classrooms. Thank you so much. I'm really interested in this topic to the extent this is something you want to continue to talk about uh, electronically. I'm delighted to do that. And just see me after Amy, and uh, we can talk more. Thank you all very much. Thank you. So as we transition, I think that Norm has set up the norms. Sorry, you did that, not me. That'd be great. Thank you. How many of these things can one person wear? I have a belt. I don't, so uh -huh. this will be fun. Um, so one of the things that I love about what Norm was saying in setting this up is that the relationship between what's happening at the home and what's happening, I'm just going to hold it, what's happening in church is really important. And that's where I want to transition is to the conversations that are happening at home that then scaffold and set up the beautiful conversations that can happen at church. So, Joe, I'm just going to ask you to go up there and drive, okay? <laughs> Thanks. Um, so when I described this lesson, this conversation today, there are three key elements. And at the heart of this conversation is this idea around agency. So how do we tap into the doctrine of agency both at home and in our classrooms at church to then create an environment in which students are engaged in deep gospel living and learning? And go ahead, Joe. One of the things I want to just address is this idea of agency. I believe that agency is one of the core doctrines of the church. And I believe that it informs everything. And when you go back to read both Elder Ballard and President Nelson's talks around this new home-centered church-supported approach to deep learning, you'll see this notion of agency being referenced quite frequently. Go ahead, Joe. So as we talk about this, I want to just get some shared understanding around what we're talking about with agency. I love this quote by Elder Christofferson when he talks about agency in both temporal and spiritual matters is this idea that we now assume personal responsibility. So when it comes to gospel teaching and learning, each of us has an individual responsibility with that. And that's going to require a shift both in the teacher role in the classroom, a facilitator role in those teacher council meetings that Norm was talking about, as well as our roles at home. Go ahead. Another idea that I really like with this is this idea by Elder Hales, that agency leads us to express our inward spiritual desires in an outward behavior. So I think that all of us have an inward desire to become more like the Savior, to learn more about his doctrine. But how do we translate that into the behaviors in our home so that it becomes a sanctuary of faith, a place of deep gospel living and learning. And we learned this morning um, by Elder Clark that that becomes both all about three things, the knowledge, the doctrine, our skills, or our ability to use that, and then, of course, our ability to become something different. Keep going, Joe. Um, I love this by Elder Cook when he talks about making choices consistent with our covenants. What, what covenants have we made as the adults in a home? Whether we're living in a single home, as parents, as husband and wife, as a sibling, what covenants have we made to know and become more like the Savior? And how does our home become a living laboratory of that? Go ahead. As we think about this, I love this by Elder or by President Monson when he talks about how we're all making constant choices. Some choices will not be very important, but some will make all the difference. I don't know about you, but when this change came about in the church, I had a really distinct impression 
both as a wife and as a mother, that this shift in the way we do gospel learning in the home was one of those things that really matter. I remember sitting in women's conference when President Nelson asked the women to reread the Book of Mormon, and he did not give us very much time, by the way. Busiest time of year. And I remember having a really conscious choice. Am I going to obey that invitation? And how is that invitation going to prepare me for what he's going to invite me to do next? Right? I've talked to lots of people who had that similar impression. And this was that sense of something really matters. And I was grateful for the opportunity I had to really get prepared for the promptings of the Spirit that would follow. Keep going. As we move to this idea about deep gospel living and learning, I'm not going to spend very much time, but I want to show you a couple of really quick quotes. This idea by Elder Clark, see I'm asking Joe to read my mind, which he does do, um, connects back to what we got when this new idea of gospel focused in the home was introduced to us. I love this. The kind of learning we're going for is the kind that strengthens our faith, leads to miraculous changes, the change of conversion that doesn't happen all at once, but extends beyond a Sunday school classroom or a young women's room or primary into our home. Go ahead. I also love this idea that it's integrated, it's harmonized, it's coordinated, so that every individual and family in the church owns it, creates it, and benefits by it. As we move forward, I like to think about then, while we're looking at this kind of a deep learning environment, we're really talking about living, learning, and teaching. So what does this look like in my family? Joe, I'm going to have you skip two slides ahead. Keep going. In creating an environment, at the heart of this for me is I go back to this principle of agency and then say, so what do I really want to have happen with my own family? Do I want this to be a mom-directed, okay, it's time for family night, everybody come together? Do I want it to feel like my own home when I was growing up where my father brought us together every Monday night? I'm nine of 11 children, and I still have images of one brother sound asleep under the piano, one person sitting on the couch, two fighting with each other. I mean, you guys know, we all grew up in different homes, and we saw different varieties of this, but how do we change from that family home evening to this idea of deep living and learning? For me, at the heart of this is bringing agency into this conversation. So the beginning of this conversation looked like this. Go ahead, Joe. As I framed this, keep going. More, <laughs> more. Thank you. I share a picture of my family. So currently, my family represents these different demographics. I have a married daughter who's living in our basement with her husband. I have a daughter who's single living away from home in college. I have a son on a mission. And I have a 16-year-old who thinks she's 30, which is awesome. But we find that we have some really unique dynamics. And as someone who facilitates this conversation in our ward, one of the things I've tried to do is bring in and organize us by different seasons of life groups. So I'll have us come together in these teacher council meetings, instead of by auxiliaries that we work with, as seasons of life groups. So we have people coming together whose children have all moved away from home. People coming together who have lots of little children people coming together who have mixed families, kind of like mine right now, and addressing what are we doing about this and how can we make the most of this wonderful covenant opportunity. So this is where I start asking this question. Within the curriculum, within the doctrine of the church, what opportunities are there for choice, voice, decision-making, agency? So I ask myself, how can I create a better environment in my home by turning some of these ideas over to my kids? As soon as the new year came, our ward fasted the, that last week in December to know how we could better apply and create sanctuaries of faith in our homes. As a family, we fasted. As a family, we came together as a family council, and my husband and I asked our children, what do you want to have happen with this? Because we sense this is really important, but we don't have all the answers. Coming to a space of absolute vulnerability of saying there was no manual given to us as parents. We don't know what to do. And we started asking our, our kids these questions. What do we want to learn? Where? When? How? And to what end? For what purpose? So I want to share a couple of quick examples. In different seasons of my life as a parent, I've noticed that what we want to learn changes. I remember as a young girl, as my older brothers were preparing for going on missions, suddenly the scripture changed in our house, the scripture study. 
My dad was all about getting as much doctrine in these guys as, as he could right before they would leave for their missions. I've also noticed at different seasons in my life, I felt different promptings as a parent in terms of what my children need. I felt at different times, my husband and I felt a few years ago, that we needed to use the histories of our ancestors as our topic for our family discussions around the gospel. We read stories about great grandpa Wood and how he served a mission in Houston, Texas in the early 40s, in the heat with a wool suit coat. And I didn't know at the time why studying his history was going to be critical, but I have a son serving a mission who testifies every week in his emails why the example of his great grandfather matters to him now as he does difficult things. As we studied the commitment of grandparents who loved each other for decades, we didn't know then, but we're starting to see now why that course of curriculum was an inspired course. We've had times in our lives where we felt really prompted to read all of the conference talks in the Ensign. And we try really, really hard right before the next general conference to make sure that we have all read and listened to those talks. We had a season of life when we were living in New York City in Manhattan, right off of Central Park, and we started calling it the cleaning process. As we'd been in the city all day long, we'd come in from the city, we'd come into our apartment, and my kids would take their shoes off in the hall, and we'd like take our subway clothes off and get into our own home clothes. Every night, we would read and listen to conference talks. We did not skip a night. And it wasn't always directed by my husband and I. It was mostly directed by our children because they had this sense of protection that they needed before they then left the apartment to go back out into the city. It was an inspired curriculum. We also find times when we read purely out of the standard works. We found that we sometimes do that slowly and sometimes we do it very quickly to meet our commitments to prophets' challenges. I have been on airplanes and cars and hotel rooms when we were listening and reading to meet President Hinckley's challenge before midnight on December 25th. We've done those challenges and we found that given the context, we've had the flexibility to do what we needed. And now as we work through the Come Follow Me curriculum, even within that, every week we say to our kids, what parts do we want to share together as a family? There's an expectation that each of us are doing it individually, but as we come together, what stood out to you? What would you like our discussion to be about? Do you see how that feels just a little bit different as you apply agency to these ideas? Let's go to the next one. Where do we study? I don't want to spend very much time, but these are some of our play favorite places to have gospel-centered discussions in our home. In mom and dad's bed? What? Yes, we do. Even with our adult children, one of our favorite places to be is everybody comes in and jumps into that safe space where we're holding and loving and cherishing each other as we talk about gospel concepts around the kitchen table, in the vehicle on the way to soccer practice, wherever we can. We want to bring these, co these topics and conversations into our everyday life. We want to create sacred spaces, not just in a formal living room, not just in a church building, but we want our children to find these spaces wherever we go. I remember learning from Brad Wilcox early on. I'm an elementary ed major, and he was one of my professors. And he said, you might find your most sacred space is when your kids are stalling, trying not to go to bed at night. Do you guys find this? <laughs> All of a sudden, my eight-year-old will come in and say, Mom, who's Heavenly Father's father? And I'm thinking, this is a stall technique. She's trying to stay awake, right? But I want you to think about how do we step into those spaces and make them sacred? as they ask questions, as they initiate these doctoral discussions. So when do we study? We found in our home every single time of day, whenever the questions come up, first of all, and in different seasons of life, we ask our kids. We simply ask them. As we start a new school year, when's going to be our best time? And we often revisit it about six weeks into the school year because reality has kicked in. We almost always start out thinking we can do early morning, that hasn't worked for our family. <laughs> We're not early morning people. And as our teenagers got really busy into high school life and into college life, late in the evening was also not the ideal. When this new program came out, I had all these really high aspirations that we were going to come home from church and take advantage of that third hour that was no longer in the building. I tried that one week with my 16-year-old, and she's like, oh, I'm so burned out. Why do we have to talk about gospel things right now? I've just done two hours of come follow me. 
and I immediately knew that was not the right time. We're finding it kind of wiggles, depending on what's happening, depending on our other extended family commitments and what's happening in their lives. We wiggle it in to the right space and time based on our kids. And most of the time we ask them, when's going to be the best time for you today? Going back to that principle of agency of giving them the choice, they're driving this conversation. When we think about how we've approached it through lots of different resources, um, I will always hold sacred a time when my daughter was a senior in high school, and she and I created this sacred space in our basement where we kept our scriptures and our marking pens and our scripture journals. And every day for a year, we got up together and read our scriptures. That is not only a sacred space, but a sacred time that I will always cherish. I think about some of the times where we've used the seminary reading as our approach to this. When I've got a daughter who's trying to finish the DNC so she can graduate in time, we all join in to support each other in our gospel study. I love the new study notes, tags, features that the church has given us that are used through digital study. And I also love bringing in inspired books that are both written by members of the church and members not of the church. Truth is truth, and I love bringing those resources in. My favorite resource is the LDS Citation Index. If you haven't looked at this, I would highly recommend you do this. It's on your phone, it's on your computer, it's absolutely free. When Elder Clark this morning was talking about journeys of forgiveness, a few years ago, I was teaching here at BYU as a professor, and I had the prompting one morning as I'm parking my car in the Jesse Knight building that I needed to fortify my family. And specifically, I needed to forgive. And so I called my husband. I'm like, that's a bad sign when <laughs> you get that kind of a prompting. He said, you're right. We ought to do something differently about it. So I went to Citation Index and typed in forgiveness. And what I found, it's like taking your topical guide and index and your most knowledgeable friend and putting it into one space. I was able to read every scripture, every talk, that referenced forgiveness ever given. So when I came to a space of saying to Heavenly Father, what does forgiveness look like for me? He was able to guide me through those resources to help me understand what that pathway looked like. It was a very individualized pathway. It was a very comprehensive pathway. And I was grateful for the events that then followed that I was in a place because I knew the doctrine to apply it and to become something different. Let's keep going. I want to kind of wrap this idea up, and I'm going to try and apply what Norm just shared. This promise right here, I love this. I hope that we're filled with gratitude for the right of choice. Well, we also accept the responsibility of it and think about the consequences of it. As you think about gospel learning in your home and how you're preparing your family to then engage in gospel living at church, what are your thoughts? How could you engage in this idea of choice with your own family, both at home and extended? What are your thoughts? Please. I'm really good at wait time, so share it, please. We started out by, we just gathered the kids and we said, talk to us. Yep. I love that, Shara. Thank you. Somebody else? Yes, please. So we've been doing uh, this youth and spiritual time for many, many years. Uh, my mother introduced us to, and I think because of that pattern, as this program got instituted, I was just like, wow. For us, anyway, for me, it was an aha because here we were so many years doing this consistently. I had that spiritual time with the children. Mm -hmm.
love that feeling of the spirit that they have all together in a bonding moment together. They want to do that. Beautiful. I love that. Brother Borden, please. So the altar that my wife has created in our home ever since we were first married is the dining room table. <laughs> I love that. And I think that what you're both hinting at here as well is you're creating some norms around consistency and safety and how we engage with each other. If these conversations happen once a year and priesthood holder or parents come together and say, it's time for family council, what do the kids say? Oh no, what's wrong? Are we in trouble? What's happening? Did you lose your job? Are we moving? But if you can create these sacred spaces with some consistency and some norms around safety, then we come together because we all own this together. We are a family unit. You know, I mentioned I come from a family of 11. How do I do that with my siblings who are all much older than I am in very different seasons of life and live all over the country? How do we continue to have these kind of conversations even when our children are no longer physically present? And I think Norm brought up some really wonderful resources. How does technology help us? How to create those consistent calls, a family newsletter, family gatherings, to again create these safe, sacred places. Please, yes. <laughs> That's awesome. And it allowed you to clarify some doctrine, perhaps. <laughs> That's awesome. Great. Go ahead, Joe. So a couple of years ago, I had an experience. Um, we went into an art museum, and one of my children said, oh, this is my favorite artist. I can't wait for you to see this artist. And we came around in the corner. I'm 5'2", not very tall, and so I came right up to it, and this is what I saw. And my initial thought was, um, probably like you, we've done a lot of work with kids in art. I thought, wow, well, I've worked with kindergartners who have done stuff like that. <laughs> she said, Mom, you're not looking at the right perspective. Step back. And step back even further. Do you see it? This is my daughter who's 5'9", standing next to that piece. You can see how large it is. But if I went right up close to it, I would only see that piece that looked like kinder. When I step back in a greater perspective, I see the whole picture. Let's go to this next quote. Elder Bednar, each family prayer, each episode of family scripture study, and each family home evening is a brushstroke on the canvas of our souls. No one event may appear to be very impressive or memorable. Truthfully speaking, some Sundays it's horrible. Most Mondays it doesn't happen. We have to create these sacred spaces. And when you look at them, you're like, yeah, that looks like something a kindergartner kid could do. But when you step back and see the whole picture, he says, but just as the yellow and gold and brown strokes of paint complement each other and produce an impressive masterpiece, so our consistency in doing seemingly small things can lead to significant spiritual results. I love listening to my daughter. She came home from her mission, and she was talking about teaching the doctrine. And I said, where did you learn that? That is amazing. Oh, Mom, I learned that in a conversation at the kitchen table. And I was like, I don't remember that. She said, but I did. As I talked to my son on the mission now, where are you learning that? I'm learning that in really small moments. And I love this idea that when we're up close, we think it's not working. It might not be enough. I'm not sure if I'm getting to that really sacred space that President Nelson described, that I've covenanted to create. And yet when you step back, you start seeing 
like you described, these beautiful, safe places for our kids to learn the doctrine that then translate to church. And when we have inspired teachers asking inspired questions to say to our youth and our adults, what did you learn this past week in your individual gospel study that applies to how the Savior is teaching this parable? Now we see a shift to deep learning. We see exactly what Elder Clark talked about this morning. What did you learn on your own that now applies within? As we wrap it up, let me share one last quote. Well, skip this one, go to the next one. This is by President Nelson when he introduced this idea. This kind of gospel study in our home has some really important blessings. I want you to think about what you want for your own life, for your own family, your extended family, your ward family. Do any of these not apply? He said each family through conscientious and careful study will have the opportunity to transform their home into a sanctuary of faith. I promise you, and this is a prophetic promise, as you do so, over time, Sabbath days will be a delight. I want that. Your children will be excited to learn and to live the Savior's teachings, and the influence of the adversary in your life and in your home will decrease. Changes in your family will be dramatic and sustaining. Friends, I think all of us have the commitment and the opportunity to create sanctuaries of faith in our own lives, in our own homes. I would ask you to engage others, the people that you're learning with, season of life groups, neighbors, ward members, family members, to apply the doctrine of agency to this sacred opportunity. Ask, what do we want to learn? What do we want to have happen? Where, when, and how can we engage in this work together? I testify to you that this has brought these prophetic blessings into my own family as I try to create armors for my children as they go out into this crazy world, as I create an armor for my own self individually to navigate the different thinking and approaches to living in today's world. I'm grateful for this prophetic promise, the challenge, the covenant, and the beautiful blessings associated with that. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.